Here's a British submarine preparing for sea. She takes aboard the weapons of her trade, the torpedoes. The submariners call them fish. They're vastly improved in design these days. These are homing torpedoes, which are unlikely to miss the target they're fired at. Week in, week out, Britain's underwater fleet goes through its training paces, tests out new gear, new techniques, and keeps up with the demands of defence today. Until the nuclear-powered dreadnought comes along, this is the latest type of British submarine. She's taking aboard all she'll need for a long spell at sea. Long enough for a man to grow himself the world's most handsome chest protector. This gardener plants shrubs which may flower and die before he sees his garden again. He's Lieutenant Commander Ken Vaughan's Royal Navy. In peacetime, he goes to his boat, as you or I might go to our office. But every now and then, he goes off on a longer trip. He may come back, not just to different flowers in his garden, but to a different garden. He and his wife, Joan, have lived in some 45 homes in the service. And this is his command, the narwhal, one of a family of sea mammals called the porpoise, the rockwell, the cachalot, the grampus. In port, she sports a rare device, a genuine narwhal's tooth. Commander Vores was there at the birth of his ship two years before in Barrow with the key members of his crew. They know to a final fraction everything she's capable of, every rivet, every nut and bolt. Narwhal and her sisters were the first operational submarines built for the Royal Navy since the war, and they're as proud of her performance as they might be of a champion. Now she's ready to put to sea. She'll slide away from her depot ship in a Scottish loch, and those watching from the shore will see a British submarine going out on a training cruise. Trips such as these form part of the peacetime routine, but today their range is immensely increased and very long voyages underwater are a commonplace. From this motor room, they'll control her movements. The noise of the diesels is so deafening that the engine room artificers have to wear earmuffs, very special ones. They have tiny built-in radios which pick up orders transmitted on a loop above their heads. The casing party are the last men down. The last to take below a memory of land and sunlight to last them through the coming weeks. This submarine is capable of continuous submerged patrol in any part of the world, coming up only occasionally to snorting depth to run her diesels which charge her batteries. These can push her underwater at a speed unthought of a few years ago. Down come the hydroplane fins which help control her when she's dying. Narwhal has already been right across the Atlantic to America underwater. The big bump on her bow is the sonar dome. She bristles with radar and detection equipment of all kinds, most of it highly secret. Now she sinks into a world peopled with creatures very much like herself. This is her element. She's a killer submarine. The deadliest weapon with which to hunt enemy underwater craft is the submarine itself. Yet today, Britain can muster only about 50 submarines of all kinds. The Russians have more than 500, the Americans half that number. So, along with a handful of its fellows, 
this craft carries with it an overwhelming responsibility as a vital unseen cog in the network of defense. In war, that boat might have been a fat prize for any submarine. Today, some powers use their submarines as advanced warning stations. Behind sealed doors lie the top secret eyes and ears of their defense systems. Even on the long maneuvers underwater, there are many things to keep a commander busy and a navigator on his toes. For its duration, the coxswain becomes the doctor with a cheerful slogan to work by. If it's above the belt, give him an aspirin. If it's below, a number nine. An officer edits the narwhal's newspaper. Circulation, 70, all hands. And that's how many they have to cater for in this tiny galley. These submarines can last underwater as long as their food holds out. These days, they have big refrigerators stocked with fresh frozen foods. Boils and other complaints from too much canned food are rare now. But 70 men is still a lot to pack inside the hull of a submarine already crammed with machinery, batteries, radar, weaponry and it takes a special kind of adjustment to live on top of each other like this. The Narwhals are a happy bunch, and for entertainment, there are cards, picture shows, even their own skipper group. Long as some of these trips may be, few submariners today seem to take advantage of the chance to grow a beard. But if you don't mind things a little cramped, there's a chance of catching up on your sleep. In war, maneuvers, or an alert, the rules are very different down below. The degree of silence imposed may mean your radio is shut off. There's no hammering, and you move about in rubber shoes. In silence, you simply listen. And you take no chance with any alien noise you pick up at all. Not if there's a slightest doubt. That means total silence. Fans off. No skiffle, no talking even. You listen as you've never listened before. If only silence answers you, having waited, you may venture a look, see if it came from the surface. If you find only emptiness up there too, you still wait. Seventy silent men in an underwater craft grown as quiet as a tomb. This is the cold, quiet vigil, the silent watch. For this submarine on its marathon patrol, it may be a long time before they're back within cozy range of home, and they break surface within sight of it again. How long has it been since the captain left his guard? He left it in warm sunshine. They come back in coldness, in rain. But it's a wonderful feeling, that rain on your face. You're very glad to be back. 